I think I've found a way to save a million girls' lives, and it's really simple. Tell young girls in Southern Africa that older men are nine times more likely to have HIV. They think it's the total opposite. They think young boys, they're running around at the clubs, they have raging hormones, they're having lots of sex, they have HIV. Older men are wise, safe, mature, married, their wives have menopause, they don't have HIV. That's what everyone's telling us. Uh, we've done surveys with 42,000 kids in Botswana where I live, and over 90% of people get this totally wrong. Can you get to age 40 without being 21? No. Uh, if you could, that's awesome. Please share. That's, that's great. Uh, but you can't. Uh, and so if you're 40, you were once 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, all the way up to 40. You're at exponentially higher risk. So people are thinking about discrete risk instead of cumulative risk. Uh, and 45% of 40-year-old men in Botswana are infected with HIV. It's a pervasive myth. And if you bust this myth, you can reduce pregnancy, also a proxy for unprotected sex and HIV, by almost a third. Randomized trials, the gold standard in evidence, have showed this 10 years ago. And it was never scaled. This was shown, this dramatic intervention, which could have had huge ramifications, was shown 10 years ago and was never scaled. It's that year after year after year accumulating dust on a library shelf. I read about this idea five years ago when I was at MIT, and part of this very lovely but dust-friendly enterprise of research. Essentially, you discover cool stuff, and then it sits there. Uh, and I loved it. I loved the magic of taking data and numbers, turning it into meaning. I ran a lot of regressions in dark rooms at MIT. Uh, and you discover stuff. You could discover stuff that doesn't work, that does. But I felt like it wasn't very meaningful. Like, my results would totally disconnected from the real world. So when I came to Botswana on a Fulbright to do more research, this time at the University of Botswana, uh, I saw things that made my heart stop and my mind totally race. Sugar daddies everywhere. Uh, older men who were giving young girls gifts in exchange for unprotected sex. And I talked to a young girl, a poet, and she read me a very moving poem uh, about an older man who had infected a young girl with HIV, a sugar daddy. And the paper I read at MIT invaded my brain. This dramatic intervention which worked could have saved the young girl's life. And I was like, here's this huge problem. And I think there might be a potential solution. And they've never met. I was like, this is my chance to not just do research, but use research to save lives. And so me and Moitepi and Brenda and Unami, the founding team, uh, we said, we don't need a dollar, we don't need a pula, we don't need a penny, we're going to start. So we piloted in clinics, schools, and we started an NGO called Young Love, dedicated to scaling HIV awareness programs shown to work to millions of youth, scaled by youth. And it's been amazing. Even though sugar daddies is a very taboo uh, and uncomfortable topic to talk about, uh, the community has embraced us. Because backed by evidence, we're not in the business of feeling good. We've got a high potential solution, and we're in the business of doing good. Uh, and so what do we know? We know that giving relative HIV risk information can create real behavior change. But that's not enough. You've got to deliver it right. You can't send old, crusty officials to talk to young girls about sex. But as many of you probably know, it happens all the time. Uh, and so at Young Love, we do it differently. We scale messages by youth for youth. We harness the credibility, relatability, engagement, and pizzazz of youth for maximum traction. Our messages work and our delivery model is maximized for impact on the youth. And we've learned some cool things along the way. Like I said, you can't just walk into this classroom with your proven intervention and talk to kids about sex. It's awkward, it's uncomfortable, it's what we tried to do at the beginning. No one was talking. Uh, so what do you do? What would you do? And the solution's really simple, and it wasn't found in research. It was found in our youthful bones, an icebreaker. When I say young, you say love. Young, love, young, love. I didn't know if you were going to join me, so I had to call out for myself. Uh, yeah, simple. You're ready to talk about sex, or more ready. Instead of having kids just tell them the, the HIV rate by age, we have them guess it in small groups. They guess it totally wrong. They commit to it in front of the classroom. Then we do a drum roll, reveal the graph, 
gasps, physical gasps, they're shocked, shatter expectations, they remember the risk forever. It's been amazing. We got a mandate from the Ministry of Education to reach every child in the country. Uh, and with a local staff of 50 young people, we've reached 343 schools and 30,000 youth in the last year. We've only been around a year. Uh, and we're hoping to reach one to two million more in the next two to three years in Southern Africa. So I've made a shift from an entrepreneurial researcher to a research-loving social entrepreneur. Uh, it's a small niche, but it's one I deeply believe in. I used to be enchanted by the magic of taking data and numbers and turning it into meaning. And as a researcher, I created meaning. Now I turn those results and papers into campaigns for millions, or soon will. And as a young social entrepreneur, I not only create meaning, I create real impact. Pretty sweet. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. So there are organizations a lot older than yours with less sophistication in their approach or evidence base. Um, and I find your energy and passion extremely compelling. But you work in Botswana, where age actually does matter. Um, and although in the classroom, youth might be an asset, what about when you go in and you're talking to the Ministry of Health or government? How does youth work for you or against you in that situation? Wow, uh, it's an intense question. Uh, and we've gotten many bizarre looks, me and my team. Uh, and my, my development manager, Unami, actually sits on committees with, with very high-level folks in government. Uh, and when we walk into a room, people go, ah, these guys don't know what they're talking about. Uh, and so it's been a big challenge. Uh, and I think we've managed to, to do well because what we're doing, and when you see it in the field, we actually we invite folks who are skeptical, and not skeptical, but especially skeptical, into the field. They come into the classroom. They see the kids' reactions. And they go, whoa, you guys kind of are onto something. And so we don't just talk, talk, talk about it. We say, you don't believe us? Come and see it. And so we are able to schmooze and convince people to see it in action. Uh, and when that happens, it clicks. And then that's, that's when we, we get the credibility, not because of our age or wrinkles, not that old people have wrinkles, but, uh, but because of, of the sheer proof of concept of, of what's happening. Makes sense. So there was a good article in Foreign Policy recently called International Development's Awkward Phase. Mm -hmm. um, and it talked about how everyone speaks so earnestly about challenges with youth and how important it is to invest in youth and address unemployment, address sexual and reproductive health but nobody actually does it because it is messy and complicated, but right at the time when people are about to become healthy and productive adults, maybe, is when the sector doesn't invest as much. It's easier, and there have been real gains from investing in vaccinating kids, for example. Why do you think the international development sector doesn't invest in youth? Hmm. Or do you think they do? Maybe you think they do. And, I, and I, so I guess there's two ends. Why, why would you invest in someone beyond the youth and before the like, adolescent youth uh, phase? I think sometimes people think that that kind of slightly beyond teenager group, it's, it's almost too late. Like what's happened, happened. But that's, that's not true. Actually, most pregnancies uh, happen in that age group in, in Botswana, right? And that's a key debilitating factor. That's when you're dropping out of school. Uh, and HIV infection rates are 5% at the 15 to 20 year old range and then they shoot up to 45%. Mm -hmm. So it actually is the critical window. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think when you just think about behavioral change and how people's habits uh, formulate over their life, you think it's too late. But when you actually look at what's happening at that age group, it's the critical time and it's when those messages are most salient. If you tell a nine year old don't have sex, you know, they're like, what are you talking about? Or maybe not four, five, six, but at, you know, at like 12, 13, 14, 15, they're like, whoa, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. It's salient to me, and like, whoa, maybe there's a way I can save my life and get an education and, and, and have a, a better life that I deserve. So what's it like for you to be younger than the people on your team? <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, so I'm younger than most of my amazing staff, uh, and it's exciting. I think it's really exciting. Do you think they uh, think it's exciting? <laughs> uh, I think they think it's uh, shocking. Um, so I was just having a conversation with my research manager the other day, Sidi, and she was like, I can't believe you're so young. How old are you? Uh, 23. 23. And um, there's, a, there's a quote that I really like that, that 
we say in Young Love, because we say it as an organization, but also individually, it's not the years in your life, it's the life in your years. Uh, and so we believe that really deeply. And for us, it's all about what you can do, not how many years you have you know, on your life scale or what have you. So it's not the years in your life, it's the life in your years. Thanks, Noam. Cool. Thanks.